Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Mistress Christiana McGrain, and this is part two of Breaking the Fast. We have talked about the kind of foods that would have been eaten in the Middle Ages, both as a beginning meal of the day for breaking the fast and also as afternoon and evening meals of foods that we recognize as breakfast foods. And so in this portion, we're gonna talk about those foods that we recognize as breakfast foods. And uh, I'm gonna cook a few of them. I have a few cooked up that I'm gonna use uh, to uh, show you what some things look like. And uh, hopefully if you have questions or if you wanna cook along at home, you're welcome to do that as well. All right, so I'm gonna come over. I'm working on two cameras now. So I am gonna be over here on this camera now so that I can show you some close-ups of food. So here's my sop, right? This is my piece of bread. It has been uh, toasted. I didn't put it on a gridiron. I'm gonna move you over to my, oh no, that doesn't help me. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Um, it's just a husk of bread. There's nothing special about that at all. And if I were going to eat this as a sop, I would just dunk it into whatever fluid that I was gonna do that with, milk, wine, broth, ale. And we know that they had bottles of ale sitting around for breakfast. Um, and that would be it. That would be my breakfast, a sop et hastily. That's our 14th century reference. Um, Nothing fancy about a sop. I mean, it really is basically what we would now call a crouton. Uh, if we were gonna be French, we would say that that's a crouton. And um, uh, French onion soup is probably a decent example of maybe a uh, pottage that might be sitting on the stove overnight and then a crouton laid on top of the broth that would come there. All right, so that's that one. This is one that we didn't talk about, but it, uh, somebody asked yesterday if uh, we were using period meals and what we liked the, to use the most. And I think this is one of my favorite recipes. This is a tart of spring greens. And um, I'm not a huge fan of bitter greens. Uh, spring greens tend to be very, very bitter. And I know they're good for me and I do like them, but I, I don't like the bitter flavor. And I love this recipe because it's got currants in it and you might be able to see the little currants in here. It's also got ginger and a little nutmeg, but there's no cheese. Um, and so it's the sweetness of the currants. They're small and they just give a little punch of sweetness and that counteracts that bitterness of the spring greens and I just love this combination. I used a friend's chicken eggs that came from her farm and they just produced the most amazing, see if I can get right on camera with that, look at that golden color. You don't find that in a commercial chicken egg. I just thought that was beautiful. So it made this gorgeous green and gold tart for my Easter morning uh, tart of spring greens. So could you eat that as a breakfast food? Certainly you could because you would bake that the day before and then there would still be slices of that left over. So that's quite potentially something that you could eat, you know, a cold slice of, of a tart like that. It's not quite a quiche. Like I said, there's no cheese in it. Although some versions of this have Parmesan or other hard cheeses uh, added to it. So proto quiche for sure. What is the base that it is on please? The crust is a commercial gluten-free pie crust because I'm gluten-free and I didn't feel like making a pie crust yesterday. <laughs> so I was lazy. Um, the problem with this particular brand of gluten-free pie crust is it is a little sweet, so I can't use it for, for savory pies, like meat pies so much. But because the sweetness factor is already present in this pie, it works okay. The plate itself is one of Mr. Sonora Thescor's pottery pieces. Um, it's, a, it's a medieval reproduction plate, which I love. All right, peas porridge. Let's talk about peas porridge. Peas porridge hot, peas porridge cold. There we go. All right, so I started this peas porridge on Friday night. Well, we were talking and listening to people on the West Coast Culinary Symposium, and I didn't, I wasn't able to get all of my ingredients, so I just started with the peas and the carrots and onions and mushrooms, 
um, and some bacon. And I let that cook and I started with uh, split green peas and yellow chana dal, which are a split yellow pea. And I let that cook and then I chilled it overnight. I did not leave it on the fire overnight for three nights. I put it in the fridge, but you know, you got to do what you got to do. I also don't have a fire <laughs> in my house bank that I could put it on. And then the next day I added leeks and ham and cooked it again and added much more water to it because the peas had absorbed all of the water that it had gotten. And then I put cooled that back down and put that in the fridge. And then this morning I get it out and I heated up a, a batch and there's my peas porridge hot three days old. And I gotta tell you, it's delicious and it gets better every day. And then here is my peas porridge cold. And that was before I put it in the pot to heat it up. I just took slices out of it and put it on my plate. And it is what we would call stonding or chargeant. It holds its own. It is stiffened and thickened. And that's the piece. And that's after I've added water twice. Um, I actually added water a third time to heat that up. And the peas just keep absorbing more moisture. So you can see where you could eat that cold. Um, you could smear that on some bread and walk out the door with it um, so that you could use that of uh, the 1584 manual that talked about using bean butter in Lent. So if you smeared that on your bread, then you'd have something, you know, to, to have moistened on your bread and you could go out the door with that. Um, so that's the very ubiquitous peas porridge hot, peas porridge coal. Any questions? I hear somebody. Uh, yeah, with, uh, with that, regards to that, that could almost be like we would call split pea soup mm -hmm. nowadays, right? Totally. That's exactly what it is. Exactly what it is. Now, the whole, the thing about the nursery rhyme, pardon my puppy dog coming and going. She's going to sit and woof at me about this. Um, you would continue to add things to a pot that was on the stove. Um, it might just be a continual boil uh, or simmer of the scraps, the ends, the fat, the gristle, the ends of things. And then you might strain that and, and create something with it, use it for a sauce. So that, that porridge pot is a mystery. You know, we don't know exactly what was in it and it probably changed from day to day or at least from season to season. Um, so what was in your peas porridge? was whatever was growing in your garden. But, um, but the basis is very close to what we consider uh, split pea soup, yep. I don't know about nine days. Three is great. <laughs> not, sure that, not sure that nine, let me go ahead and just taste that. Mm. Oh, that's so good. Mm. And I didn't put any seasoning in that other than salt and pepper. Everything else is just the development of flavors. When I teach um, cooking classes and we talk about making soup, I talk about developing layers of flavor. And this is one thing that I think a lot of people miss when they're doing medieval cooking because the recipes that we have that have come down to us through the ages leave a lot of detail out. There's a lot of instruction that is not given because the cook is just supposed to know in the training. I was an apprentice chef almost 40 years ago now. Um, and I got that basis of training. I know what a hollandaise sauce is. I know what a vinaigrette sauce is. I know how to do it. I don't have to have an instruction to tell me how to do that because I've been trained in that already. And that's the way a lot of our recipes read. Um, so what we are missing is indications of how much care they took to develop layers of flavor. We know they took a lot of care to pay attention to the humoral theory, to adjust foods, to correct them, to make sure that if they were hot and dry, that they were then treated to be cold and moist and, you know, to, to temper them. So they definitely knew about multiple techniques to do subtle changes to the food. So I think uh, sauteing the bacon first to get it crispy before I used, put the peas in it and started soaking them. So I've got that extra layer of crispy bacon flavor. And then uh, I let my onions and, and carrots and, and vegetables saute a little bit before the water went on so that they got some development of flavor. So those are techniques that are missing out of those recipes that I think 
we can play with. I think we can add those in. We can, you know, use that technique and a good cook in the middle ages, hopefully would have that same technique as well. So that's a rant. Didn't plan on going on that soapbox, but there we have it. Okay. Any other questions about peas porridge, hot or cold, three or nine days old? Nope. Okay. I was just going to make a comment that there is, I'm trying to track, track down the scientific paper for it, where it talks about a, uh, a pot of stew that is done in the Caribbean and how they've been determined that because you keep adding things to it, you change up the floral and therefore you get to a stable food safe concept. I'm trying to track down the paper. Oh, I'd really like to read that. I, 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 I would I'll totally try to, like to read them. I will, I will totally, uh, you know, because it, it lends itself to that peach porridge hot nine days old sort of question. Um, and I'm just trying to, I thought I had downloaded it. So I'll, I'll try to track it down for you. Okay, fantastic. I love teaching and getting more information than I started with. That's always awesome. We had to laugh last night because people were asking for documentation on the trivia game <laughs> and getting it and being, and, and having documentation shared on topics brought up during the trivia game. I'm like, you know, Generally speaking, <laughs> people stop doing that kind of thing when they're playing games, but not us. Not us. That's what makes us great. That's right. That's right. Okay. Um, I don't have any waffles to show you because I have waffles, but they're they're like ego waffles. They're they're gluten free round waffles. You guys know what waffles look like. I don't have to show you what a waffle looks like, right? Um. We saw some Dutch masters pictures of waffles just a little while we, ago. We did, we looked at waffles. So this is more along the lines of what you might see in a Mediterranean area with fresh fruit. Obviously you're not getting this if you're a Norse farmsteader, right? So that goes back to, I can't really tell you what the individual ingredients are. It depends on what your leftovers are. Uh, so whatever you were cooking for dinner, then that's probably what your breakfast was going to be. But some nice fresh fruit and flatbread, a little bit of cheese, maybe some olive oil. If you were sitting, if you were a laborer, again, you would be getting a much more uh, plebeian, I guess would be a good word, uh, breakfast. All right. So uh, I'm going to try a little experiment here. I have, these are modern rolled oats. They are not the, the oat groats, which is what I should be using. Um, just in case you don't know, uh, the method for making oatmeal the way we know it today with little flat oats like that, that's a mechanical rolling method. It's steamed and then rolled through mechanical rollers to flatten it. And that's to make it uh, cook faster, to make it a product that people could use and get out to work out the door to work. So not a period form. Um, I should have thought about this last night and put some steel cut oats, which are whole oat groats that have been rolled through mechanical metal rolling uh, cutters because that would have been a little closer, but we're gonna do what we're gonna do. So I put a little bit of almond milk on that this morning, even though it's it's Easter, I'm not, uh, not avoiding the dairy because um, uh, Catholic restrictions, which I'm not, um, but because of the dairy. And here in Meridies, it's pollen season. I don't know if uh, you get that in other areas of the world, but we have drifts of yellow pollen everywhere and eating extra dairy is not a good idea right now. So I'm sticking with my almond milk and eggs breakfast things instead of some of the more dairy uh, full versions. So I've soaked this in um, almond milk and I add a little bit of salt to it. And the reference that I'm using is from the 16th century, I believe. And it's talking about Scottish soldiers and how they carry a pack of oats on their saddle. And when they go to eat, they mix the oats with a little water and they fry it on a hot rock. And that's what they eat, that that's their breakfast. Now, um, if you're out in the rough, then you're gonna do with oats and water. If you're at home, you can do better than that. Um, so I'm using almond milk instead of, of water and salt makes a huge difference if you add a little salt to this. And then the other thing that really makes a difference is if you use some uh, uh, flavored oil, like either butter or bacon grease to, to bake these in, to cook these in. So I'm gonna use a little bacon grease. 
and give it a try and see if I can come up with a decent oat cake here. Experimental, I mean, I've made these before, but you never know what's gonna happen. Is that a container of baking grease that you just keep on your counter? Yes. That is fantastic. How do you, like, do you clarify it, to put it before putting it in there? Nope. Oh my goodness. It's a little Le Creuset. This is actually a, get, I, I judged a kid's cooking competition at a cooking uh, store. And this was my, my judge's gift. I'm like, it's a bean pot. They specifically sell this as a bean pot. It's a Le Creuset. And I'm like, what am I ever going to do with that? And then I realized it was the perfect bacon grease container size. Yeah. It's absolutely perfect. So I, I keep it on my counter. I mean, I keep my house air conditioned in the summertime, so it doesn't get that hot in here. Um, but uh, I have friends that keep them in the refrigerator because they just feel like that's what they have to do, but it's fine on the counter. I go through it fast enough that it's not going to get rancid. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for asking. I, that's the kind of stuff I don't even think about. So I'm glad when people say, wait a minute, what did you just do? Because, you know, I don't know, what, what did I just do? <laughs> I, I come from Midwest background with a mother who's very food conscious and she would never have done that yeah. in her entire life. But that's a genius idea. But, but you also need to understand that rancidity of fats, you'll, you'll taste it off before you get to a food safety problem. Oh, yeah. that's true. That's very true, and and I can do that. So, so there's a test that's called peroxide test, which will indicate you know you won't taste anything off until the number gets to be ten, but until you actually get to twenty five, it's not a food safety issue. So you get a long time before mm -hmm. safety. Yeah, issue. and if it would ever start tasting off, then I would know, but. It doesn't. I mean, the little crock keeps it fairly, uh, you know, the, keeps the oxygen off of it. The the way the Le Creuset crock works, if there's even just the smallest little bit of bacon grease around the lip, which there almost always is, it creates a seal. I don't know if you can hear it. Can you hear that? So it, it's yeah. actually sealed itself. Okay. That's cool. Bacon grease on the counter. Who knew that was going to be the thing, right? All right, let's try it. I'm going to do one and then I'm going to give myself a little insurance and put a little ground oat flour in one. Because I can, because I'm here, I'm at home. It's not something out of the... Uh, realm of possibility of what they would have done. Where's my oat flour? There it is. Heck, if I was a Scottish soldier out on the trail, I could grind a little oats between two rocks, right? If I really wanted to thicken up my, my mix. Okay, let's try another one. All right. So flatbreads and oat cakes might be our exception to the not cooking things, but I still don't think they would have gotten up and heated up a rock. I mean, again, if you cook some of these the night before and there were some left over, I think that was a much better bet. Now the bakers were probably up making bread, but that was at the bakery, not in your house. Let's see, what's my best plan of attack here? I actually want a metal spatula. Let's see what I can find here.
I don't know where it is. That's all right. I'll use this. It's kind of stuck. Oh, the ones with a little bit of oat flour are doing much better. That's a good one. There we go. I'm making oat cakes. See, that wasn't hard. You can see how this would could be done on a hot rock. And then from here, you can dress them up depending on what ingredients you have, right? So if you're out in the field, this is it. If you're at home, then you eat them with whatever else goes with them. All right, I'm gonna move this. Those are looking pretty good. This is guys. That. Okay, so I want to make a couple of different egg preparations. I've got recipes here for sogeet from the form of curry, which is 1300s, which is sage, take sage, grind it and mix it with eggs. Take a sausage and dice it and put it in a small pan, add grease and fry it. When it is fried enough, add the sage and eggs, scramble lightly, add powder deuce and serve it. If it's an ember day, take sage, butter, and eggs and let it stand well by the sage and serve it forth, which means use more sage so that you don't worry about the fact that you're missing your sausage. Um, powdered deuce. Okay, so basically we're talking about an omelet or um, an herb scrambled egg with some sausage in it. Oh, that's the herb a lot actually, but the, but this is sausage and sage um, and scrambled eggs. It's, it's really not hard. Um, again, something they would not necessarily have eaten for breakfast in period. Oh, that one's just not doing well at all, but those are pretty. We'll, we'll not show the other ones and we'll just show the pretty ones. Look how beautiful my two perfect, don't look at those. My two perfect <laughs> cakes are. Right. There we go. Aren't they beautiful? Don't pay, pay no attention to the mess in the corner. All right. All right. So I'm going to go with a quick. Sogeet, which is sage and eggs and sausage and powdered deuce. So here I've got, I'm only making one. Now the recipe, some of these recipes call for like 16 eggs and you're making a bunch for a bunch of people, but I'm the only one here. So I'm going to make one egg for, for these guys. Um, so here I have a scrambled egg. And I've got some fresh sage. Um, these are little leaves, tiny little leaves that I'm gonna use as a garnish. And then this is one leaf that I diced up. So I'm gonna add that to my eggs. And then here I have some sausage, uh, pork sausage that I'm gonna go ahead and put in my pan. I mean, I'm even a little like embarrassed about doing a, a scrambled egg demonstration, but you know, here we are, we're making period food, not hard. And, you know, I don't know if you would really do this one. If this isn't one you would necessarily do for a feast and in the SCA, we tend to do feast food, but how much do we spend time looking at the other meals? 
the nunchins, the late night snacks, the, you know, one of the pictures that we looked at the Flegel was a couple of fried eggs and it's called a snack with fried eggs. It's not called, these are my fried eggs for breakfast. And he was not shy about saying, this is my breakfast in his other paintings. Um, it's a snack. So those fried egg dishes were later in the day. But still, that's what people are eating, but we're not gonna serve scrambled eggs and sausage at a feast. So this is that kind of recipe that kind of gets overlooked, but I mean, talk about period food is not yucky. This is, anybody would eat this, right? Well, actually the user pick I'm using at the moment is in fact a picture of me making uh, uh, fried um, apples with, with scrambled eggs from a period. Is that the so, Reek? So I kind of did. Is that the Reek manger? Yeah. Yeah. I, I've seen it done a couple of times. I've seen herbalot served as a, you know, fried and then sliced and then served on a dish as a, as a side dish at a feast. Um, yeah. And that's lovely. That, that's very nice. I tell you, I, I use the, the, the recipe for the herbalot. We'll talk about that in a second. It calls for some mint with the other savory herbs. And I Ooh. have some mint and I threw it in there and it just smells so good. And it doesn't make it overly minty. It just adds that if you're a fan of Thai food, uh, that mm. combination of basil and cilantro and uh, mint together is wonderful. It's so good. Okay. So there's my sausage. I'm gonna go ahead and whip my sage up into my egg and then add that. That's it. Scramble lightly. So I'm going to go ahead and turn my stove off. Oh, that could have used an extra egg. That's more sausage than egg, but that's okay. And that's it. Sa sausage. Sauge. It? It, it's spelled S-A-W. Where is it? S-A-W-G-E-A-T. So I want to say that that's like sauged. Such it or something along those lines rather than sogeet, which I don't think is, is correct. Okay. okay, your message, or not message, your um, recipe called for powdered deuce. What would that have been? So powdered deuce is a sweet spice blend. And I'm, I'm about to cheat right in here in front of you. So there's my sogeet. And this is a commercial pumpkin pie spice. I'm, I'm, I'm going to use it because that's basically what powdered deuce is, is sweet spices. Now, uh, powdered deuce in period might have sugar in it, which this one does not. And I think that's okay for sausage and eggs and sage. But there, I, I've just sprinkled a little bit of that sweet spices on top of it. And that's my seasoning on my sauged it. I'm sure it's delicious. It smells really good. Go ahead and... Come over here to share this with you. Mm. I know this is mean now, right? I'm going to eat in front of you and you're like, but we can't taste it. Next year. Mm -hmm. Next year in Kaid. Mm, mm. The powdered deuce is really lovely with that. I'm glad it doesn't have any sugar in it, but that cinnamon is really nice and aromatic and it really does kind of add a little, um, exotic flair, I guess, to my sausage and eggs and sage, which are all stuff that would just be, you know, pretty common. But just a touch of the powdered deuce makes it something special. Mm. Okay. All right. So now I want to work on my herb a lot, which is basically an herb omelet. Um, a second, let me clean this out. Anybody have any questions? Help if I'm off mute. Uh, in what you've been looking at, have you found that there are a lot of like egg snack things? I know you said that this is like 
there was a painting of a light snack. But does it seem to have a lot of things with like eggs? Just out of curiosity. Well, there's a lot of egg dishes. There's a lot of egg dishes. And if we're going on the theory that they did not wake up first thing in the morning and cook eggs, which there's no record of that at all, then when did they cook the eggs? Right? So they're either cooking it for one of their main meals or as a snack. And the snacking is, you know, suspect depending on how devout you are, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, So... Um, the, 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 the 1620 Flemish still life painters that were so obsessed with their breakfast is the only one that I've seen saying, look at what I'm eating for a snack. It's fried eggs. But (laughs) (laughs) I think you can extrapolate, you know, that if they're not cooking it for breakfast, then when are they making it? Plus, you know, all of our cookbooks, almost all of our extant cookbooks are for royals or for feasts. There's hardly anything that tells us about what goes on during the day. Um, So if we've got all of these recipes for eggs, they're being served for feasts or they're being served in the afternoon meals and things like that. So here's my my spice blend mix. I've got, um, wait a second, I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. So this is, this is my one egg omelet. And I, th- I think it could still go with two eggs here, but I don't want to cook that many eggs. So I've got fresh sage, fresh thyme, fresh cilantro, dried mint, dried parsley, and dried chives. So those are the herbs. So I'm putting six herbs in my herbalot. But I mean, it's, it's called herbalot. It's, it's an herb omelet. So it, it gets a lot of herbs. And like I was saying with the mint, that's a nice additive to this blend the mint doesn't become overpowering at that point it just adds a nice bright note to the to the spice blend okay so let me read you this herbalot recipe let me read the herbalot recipe where are we here we go in form of curry, which is uh, 1349, I think, it says take purcell, mints, savory and sage, tansy vervain, clary, rue, detany, fennel, southern wood, hew him and grind him small, metal him up with aaron, which is eggs, do butter in a trap and do the farce there too and bake it mess for. So that's like a frittata. That's in a trap is a, is a container. So they're pouring the butter in and then they're putting all the ingredients in and baking the eggs until they're, they're done. So you're, you're basically creating a frittata with that. And then in Le Menagier de Paris, we've got one herbalos or two of eggs. Take dittany, two leaves only, and of rue less than half the knot, a four no that is strong and bitter. Of smallage, tansy, mint, and sage, of each some four leaves or less, for each is strong. Marjoram a little more, fennel more, parsley more still, but of porridge beets, violet leaves, spinach, lettuces, and clary, as much of one as of the others, until you have two large handfuls. So you're talking about like a leaf of everything, right? Um, Pick them over and wash them in cold water, then dry them all of the water and bray two heads of ginger and then put your herbs into the mortar two or three times and bray them with the ginger and then have 16 eggs well beaten together, yolks and whites and bray and mix them in the mortar with the things above said and divide it in two and make two thick omelets, which you shall fry as followeth. First, you shall heat your frying pan very well with oil, butter, or such other fat, and spread your eggs over the pan, and turn them over and over with a flat pellet, and then cast good grated cheese on the top, and know that it is so done, because if you grate cheese in with the herbs and the eggs, when you come to fry your omelet, the cheese at the bottom will stick to the pan, and thus it befalls with an egg omelet if you mix the eggs with the cheese." Don't mix your eggs with the cheese. It's very clear on this point. And it's a very good point because he's absolutely right. Um, Wherefore, you should first put the eggs in the pan and then put the cheese on the top like three times. The counting shall be three and not four unless you know, right? Wherefore, you should put first the eggs in the pan and then put the cheese on the top and cover the edges with the eggs. Otherwise, it will cling to the pan. And when your herbs be cooked in the pan, cut your herbalice into a round or square to eat it not too hot or too cold. 
Okay, so that is a long, long explanation of saying, mix your herb and your eggs, put some fat in the pan, cook your eggs and then add the cheese. Really long winded version of that. So that's what I'm gonna do here. Uh, I've got a hot pan going. I think I'll use butter this time, just for variety. Oops, that's not butter. I was so excited when I went to a museum, it's a little hot, let you cool down a minute. I went to a museum where they were showing Leonardo da Vinci's uh, workshop papers. And I came around a corner and here is the envelope that da Vinci drew on the back of telling his non-literate um, assistants what to get for lunch for two, four or six people, however many people were in the workshop. And it was pictures of things like a pot of fennel soup and how many manchets of bread and how many pottles of wine. And it was an illustrated guide to this is what you should have in the workshop for lunch if there are these people visiting the workshop. And it was drawn on the back of an envelope that Da Vinci just picked up and, and scribbled on. It's so cool. It's just one of those little snapshots of life that we just don't get in Le Menagier de Paris or Platina or, you know, the people who are writing for the swells. Um, so that was, that was a lot of fun to see. And then I realized I had it in a book at my house, but it was still really cool to see it on the wall at the museum. I got all excited. One of those many times you don't want to be in the uh, museum with SCA people because they'll embarrass you by going, oh my God, look at that. I think that's the best way to go to a museum. <laughs> Get excited. Going here, here. with someone who gets excited about the same things you do, priceless. Of course we want to go to that. Um, okay, so I'm going to get just a little bit of fresh ginger. I'm going to grate it into the rest of this. And I'm letting my butter brown because that's another layer of flavor. Right? That, that's another way of adding some flavor to all of this. And it uh, shouldn't be getting too brown. All right, just a quick couple of gratings of fresh ginger. As we can. And then into the butter. And then, because I'm a fancy dancy trained chef, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Which is not what the recipe calls for. The recipe calls for using a flat voice, like a Spurtle. Sorry, that's our spurtle version of the drinking game. Every time you hear the word spurtle. That's not a spurtle. It is actually, it's one of the flat spurtles. It's, it's a specific kind of spurtle. It's true. I didn't make it up. It's a spatula. Okay. It's, a, it's a kind of spurtle. All right, I have real spurtle coming. All right, so there's my herb a lot. I'm not gonna put the cheese on it. Cause like I said, it's pollen season here. So there's my, uh, let me just back up here because we're just about at our time. And let me clear. I have, I, have received per, I have received permission for you to go over since we started more than 15 minutes after the hour. Oh, okay. The only, there's only one class and that's the potato session. So if anyone wants to go, do, go to the potato session, now's a good time. Otherwise, hang with. with okay, I have one more dish. I have one more dish to cook then. Please do. Okay, so I have uh, eggs is sod, and these are hard boiled duck's eggs that I made uh, yesterday. And uh, let me pull that recipe up real quick here. I really like a mustard sauce. That's another one of the, what kind of uh, period foods do you incorporate into your modern stuff? Mustard sauce on eggs? Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of them. There's sippets in mustard, which is a little more fried in oil uh, in, the, in the recipe list. Where are my eggs? I saw the... Sawed eggs, there we go. Page one, yeah. Seed your eggs almost hard, then peel them and cut them in quarters. Then take a little butter in a frying pan and melt it with a little brown. 
melt it a little brown, just like I just did for the herbal lot, and then pour them into the pan, a little vinegar, mustard, peppered, and salt, and then put it into a platter upon your eggs. So I'm going to go ahead and cut my eggs in quarters. And I have used all my dishes. I need to go grab another dish. I'll be right back. Luckily, I have lots of wonderful period dishes because I know all of these awesome potters that keep me supplied. And also, all of my period pottery was at the other end of the house of the house fire, so I didn't lose it, which was great. Okay, those are good. I, I was specifically trying to undercook these a little bit and they're, they're cooked through, but they look a little on the custardy side. Let's see if you can guys see that. And they're, they're soft. They would mash really, really soft. So I think that kind of comes in with the, the cook them until they're not quite hard. So these are just on that edge of being ready to go. All right. So there's my seethed eggs. And then I'm going to put a little butter in my frying pan, vinegar, mustard, pepper, and salt, and put them on my eggs. And because I'm going to mash another recipe together with it, I'm going to put a little bit of green onions in it too. Okay. And I am not going to measure a thing. I have some, uh, I'm using a prepared Dijon mustard for this. There's lots of variations you could go with this. You could go with mustard seeds, mustard seeds that have been soaking in the vinegar overnight or for a week, uh, prepared mustard, raw mustard, green mustard, you know, any, any kind of way. Um, I am preferring to use what I uh, feel is kind of a mild mustard because I like that on eggs. Other people might want, you know, whatever makes you happy here. All right, so my mustard's getting a little brown. I'm gonna throw in some green onions. This kind of makes it a sauce Robert with the green onions in it, but I like that. The lady who taught the mustard class yesterday touched on a couple of these eggs with mustard sauce recipes. Okay, a little bit of vinegar. Touch of mustard. Eh, let me put a little more mustard in it than that. There we go. And that's it. And what I'm looking for here is just to cook it long enough so that the vinegar loses some of its pungency. I've noticed that with these sauces that if you don't cook it at least a minute or so, then the vinegar is quite overpowering. But if you let it cook a little bit, it mellows out, blends nicely with the mustard, and then you've got a lovely dish. Okay, so here we come back over here. Get the whole table here. All right, so here's my mustard sauce going on top of my sawed eggs. There we go. All right, so we've got our tart of spring greens with greens and um, local chicken eggs and currants to give that little pop of sweetness. We've got some Mediterranean fruits that might be part of a, of a more Southern breakfast. We've got a sop to et hastily dunked in wine or broth. We've got an herbalot with fresh and dried herbs. This one is without cheese. And then I've also got some oat cakes that were just oats and almond milk and salt and a little bacon fat. 
We've got some peas porridge cold and peas porridge hot. Sogit or sogit, uh, sausage and eggs and sage. And then sod eggs, hard boiled duck eggs with a mustard and green onion sauce on top of them. All right, that brings me to the end of the things that I was gonna cook today. Anybody have any questions or comments or wanna come over for breakfast? <laughs> oh, I definitely wanna come over. <laughs> I wanna come for breakfast. Okay, here we go, we're all coming now. <laughs> questions, somebody's got questions about some of this, I'm sure. I mean, I know it's simple food. No. Don't don't whine. I'm sorry. Don't whine. But here's the beautiful thing. It's all such simple food that you can make it yourself. And you have the recipes so that you can, I mean, that's why I posted these last night because I thought anybody can walk into their kitchen and grab some eggs and sausage and maybe some sage off of their counter and, the, and they can do these, right? They're super simple. Um, and it's to three o'clock in the afternoon for me now. So I can eat these as a perfectly period person and not be, <laughs> not worry about it. They actually will be breaking my fast. I haven't had breakfast this morning yet. So this will be breaking my fast, which is, you know, it's my main meal of the day. So it's, in, it's perfectly in, in keeping with that. So I hope this has encouraged you to try out some both on both sides of it, period breakfast practices, which is not eating a big, large meal, grabbing something quick if you need to having your main meal of the day. And then those foods that we consider to be breakfast foods, in or including those in some meals, whether or not these are, are fancy enough to make it into a feast, maybe not, but certainly something that you could include in your daily menu. Mm -hmm. Anybody and else? Anybody have any questions? Uh, where were the recipes again? I know you said at the very beginning. Um, uh, Selene, can you post that one more time? I, I have posted it in uh, in the chat. I will post it again. Awesome, thank you. I've also you... posted um, um, uh, Mistress Christiana's personal website. So if you want to get a hold of her later on, you can do thank so you. or buy her Don't book. Don't be alarmed that the first picture you see on my Ask Chef Christie website is me dressed as the Viking lady from the opera. That's <laughs> A, a, a bit of a glitch. We're still trying to work through that. I do a lot of different things. <laughs> My website reflects that. And so right now the picture that automatically comes up is, is, is I think it's awesome. Um, uh, there are actually yeah, okay. pictures of me in a chef's jacket so that you know that that's oh actually me. <laughs> uh, I think I found the, the part of the chat where that was. So, okay. Thank so you. it's on I'm doing it again. It's on Google Classroom. So you open up a new tab in Google, go to the nine dots over next to your ID, click on that and then find classroom. And then you can use that class code to get to all of them. All right. And that's got a PDF of the PowerPoint. It's got a list of the illustrations separated out and it's got the recipes and I haven't uploaded the narration, all of my notes, but I will do that now. So I was waiting until after I got through all of this. Now that I've got the information on that woodcut, I'll update my notes so that that's in there too. Excellent. Yeah, that's kind of why I was waiting on that final handout because I knew I'd end up with more information to include, so. And I'm very grateful. I need to grab that information before we lose this chat. I will. Can you just grab um, it for me and then, yeah. I can grab it for you. I can send you the whole chat later if you want. Um, okay. I don't know that I need the whole chat. All that bad. Period. Hi, Christy. Oh, that's right. Mr. Uh, Duchess Juana, she did. I read that recipe. It's mm -hmm. late period in Spanish. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. indicative of, of pie crust throughout the... the... Mm -hmm. That was just uh, one I could grab real fast. Hot water pie crust is probably more along the lines of the... A lot of times their crusts weren't the edible portion. They were the container. They were the vessel. It's the lunchbox. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, and it, it, the one recipe that says do it in a trap, that's probably what they're talking about is a, is a heavy duty pastry that you're baking that in. And then you may or may not eat the part that's underneath the eggs that baked into it. You may just, you know, that could be the alms for the poor later on, but they're, you know, kind of hot water and lard and, and flour 
that are very, very stiff to hold things rather than being a delicate flaky pie crust that we might consider today. That's, that wasn't even a thing, you know? No, no, it really wasn't. So when it says do it unto a trap, that's probably what they're talking about is forming a little vessel of really stiff crust, pouring it in there, letting it bake, and then breaking the pieces of that away to get to the eggs. So you're not trying to un unmold that egg dish from inside a baked pastry. You're just breaking the pastry off and eating what's there. Right. Okay, I've got the woodcut uh, uh, information sent uh, yes, to you please. in a private message on Facebook. So you thank have you so that. much. I appreciate Whatever. that. All right. Well, that brings us to the end. If anybody else has any other questions, I'm always happy to talk about food. I'm not hard to find. Uh, um, I'm on the West Coast uh, Culinary Symposium event page, so you can find me there. Um, and I'm always happy to answer questions. My website's called Ask Chef Christie. That started with uh, Thanksgiving at my house is always the Butterball hotline. Everyone calls <laughs> the whole week, the whole two weeks before Thanksgiving it is uh, for years and years. My phone has run off the hook and that's where the beginning of Ask Chef Christie started. So um, all, and I get calls in the oddest places. I'll be, now that I've got a cell phone that, um, you know, walks around with me anywhere, there's, I, 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 at any given time, I might take a phone call and go, uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, are the green tops fresh or do they look wilted? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. People call me from markets and go, okay, well, they've got this, but they don't have that. Yes, I believe I am. I believe you are too. I'm going to cut the recording now and okay. thank everybody for coming to Breaking the Fast. <laughs>